Okay, hi. Um, welcome to the tense exercise today. We will deal with function approximation, if a function approximator is in control. A little recap. Last time, um, no, that one. Last time you have dealt with function approximators and prediction, like and the, the task of the mountain car, where you have a car which is kind of underpowered here and has to learn that, or has to swing up this mountain, and therefore you had a given policy and the task was for these continuous states and discrete actions to estimate um, the, the state values for the prediction task. And yeah, today uh, we will um, like get going with learning the policy and not taking a fix fixed policy and therefore you last time had uh, used uh, linear function approximators and in the end an artificial neural network which was some kind of able to predict the um, the state space in a somewhat good manner here and I think the input to the neural network uh, there you've just chosen the position and the velocity normalized to my mind and yeah it worked quite well and therefore let's uh, maybe go ahead and try the same but like not predicting state values but state action values which we can then use to come up with a policy right okay mm, yeah so we have the same example here like the mountain car I've just shown, um, the our state space is the position and the velocity, like just mentioned, which is in this range. And um, we will use a feature vector, like at the end of the last lecture, again, to normalize the state space into the area of plus minus one, which works quite well for artificial neural networks. Um, the input space here is... Um, our, our, our action we can choose which is y0, 1 and 2 for like force to the left, force to the right or do nothing. <coughs> okay, yeah, <coughs> let's get into the code. So we should implement semi-gradient saucer control using artificial neural networks. Let's check out what is given. We have given the featureize um, function already which takes the state and normalize it to the range plus minus one and we have a plotting function we can use later on to plot the um, cost to go like you know it from the lecture so if we take a look into the uh, pseudo code here which it's nine. Then we see, okay, on the first shot we um, need for our algorithm a differentiable function to predict or estimate the um, action values, state action values. And uh, therefore we again use artificial neural networks like you, you've learned it here with um, with TensorFlow, so we define our model. I've called model one here, like to execute different uh, models after each other, and um, yeah, we have three different actions. So you see, our input dimension will be two. We have two hidden layers here with 60, uh, 46 neurons, and um, we have three outputs. So if we go to the lecture slide. Um, number three here where we see the different topologies for uh, action value function approximators uh, what would you say which topology we are looking at here yeah the middle one what's the benefit of that um, yeah since we are somewhat predicting um, totally distinct actions, so the action is 0, 1 or 2, it's maybe harder for an artificial neural network to represent this only on a single input with 
um, and distinguish these three actions um, with only a single output, but it might be much easier directly to only on the state where we are give three outputs um, and um, for, for the action values and where there we can just check okay which is the maximum here and um, yeah choose the action that way so that enhances the learning or makes it much easier like Oliver told us so um, yeah we need a policy as policy we simply like since we have three outputs for the action values we just check which has the maximum um, action value and we will take that action as a policy then uh, we need a step size that is given we need an epsilon which is already given here and we need parameter vector omega where do we find this like this is basically the trainable uh, parameters here in the, the artificial neural network, so the weights. And for optimization, we use stochastic gradient descent and um, the MSC as a loss function. Yeah, okay, if we hop into our code, um, we start here running different episodes. Initialize our x0, which is done by the reset here. That state is then um, normalized and gives us our x0. So um, then we have to choose an action and that's shown here. So we calculate based on the state using our model, um, the action values and then epsilon greedy choose the highest action va value, uh, choose the action which has the highest action value here in this cell. Um, then we apply these action to the uh, to the environment and observe the next action the reward which is done over here and um, yeah then we of course uh, for our estimation like of the action values for the next states like seen here we need a following up action uh, where we normalize the next state, throw it into our model and get our next action value to choose our next action here for the, um, for the learning process which is following here. There we separate between like two cases. As you see here, if the state is terminal, our target, um, like we have the TD target, is just a reward, right? So if our estimated action value is similar than the reward then we're good to go and we do not have to change anything because we predict already accurate if not um, we will update based on the target here um, if uh, it's not done then our target is like shown here the reward plus a discounted next action value and therefore we need the following up action and the um, and, and the um, action value for that. So this is done here and the target is then the revert and the next action value of that next action. Yeah. Then in the pseudocode we update our weights based on the loss function here with respect to the gradients um, like we have learned it in the semi gradient algorithm type but now with um, state action values. Like in TensorFlow it works uh, as follows, you just um, you you just go into that uh, gradient tape here, and um, then you calculate uh, the action values like uh, for the state we are in. That's this one here because we want to update these guys. We need information on the forward pass, like how much influence the, um, the, the, the inputs have to the outputs. Then we can calculate the loss between the target and these calculated action values. So the loss between these two here. We calculate the gradients, which is shown like here, for the trainable parameters based on this loss. And then like we apply the gradients um, to the trainable variables, which like 
this here basically summarizes this step. And then we continue to the next state. Cool. <coughs> That's the pseudocode so far. Let me just uh, execute here a few cells. to get stuff running for later. Ah, no, 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 stop it. Just one time to sh show you something. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So, um, and then as you see here, uh, we trained for 300 episodes. And um, an episode, I think it's terminated after 200 steps or if we reach the goal and so then we get a reward of minus one every step we do not reach the goal. So um, what we see here is the um, cost to go till um, what what the agent or what what the estimator estimates for the greediest action. So we um, yeah just take the three action values and take the maximum out of it and like think what the agent could perform at its best and. We see here in the beginning it's normalized to a range of round about zero. So um, yeah, after 200 episodes, uh, the estimation looks like this here, and after 300 episodes, like this. So this is yeah not really what we have expected. I mean, if we are in the position of 0 0.5, we reach the goal, and um, it looks like it's worse in that that case like uh, to to have a high uh, ve velocity uh, to the right in comparison if we are on the totally opposite so like this estimation really doesn't make sense what we would have expected i think we have seen it in the lecture here is is uh, some something like this so that we expect here i think we can solve the task at around about 120 steps and if uh, we have a good policy which does this, we do that swing up and we see here then in the end if we are on, on this state where the uh, position is, I think here it's on, on this state, where the position is quite right to the, or near the goal and the velocity is higher then we have nearly no costs and not expecting 130 uh, steps here. Uh, yeah, I do what the problem could be. Um, to my mind, it's um, related to that generalization aspect. So, um, if you th think about why we have uh, introduced function approximators, it's um, because we have an infinite state space now, a continuous state space, which is not impossible or quite hard with computational resources, like to represent in a matrix form. And um, therefore, we can use these uh, function approximators, which, like, only knowing about the middle path here, as you see, the uh, the like uh, little dark area here is the path the agent took, um, is like um, like based on this information, the agent estimates how good or bad it is here on the outer side and. Um, in this case, based on these two inputs, like the, the estimation is like simply garbage from the artificial neural network. And uh, since like the agent didn't made it to the area, it cannot even correct these um, these assumptions based based on um <coughs> on some knowledge. So um, to counteract this we can maybe provide a proper feature engineering or like uh, Oliver introduced it like proper feature engineering based on expert knowledge for example the um, the energy was a good way to go or um, the cosine I think of three times the height or something um, I mean, you need expert knowledge for that, but um, today we will take a look at what you might do with some feature engineering tools if you don't have or actual expert knowledge about like the uh, the, the <coughs> control task. And they are already introduced uh, the so-called tile coding. Ah, 
by the way let's let's maybe I oh know we cannot execute this okay it's just running um, it's just uh, introduced this, this tile coding here um, which um, like somewhat discretizes this uh, this state space here with this grid and um, for the uh, position which is just drawn here um, with this th four different um, grid structures um, like we have binary features which are active which are indicated by this uh, highlighted colors here we we put into our artificial neural network and um, yeah using so you can somewhat uh, l locate where you are in the state space but yeah with a binary feature which tells us this is just zero or one okay um, today we would instead use now a radial basis function and not this tile coding and radial basis function um, I do it in a somewhat similar way but not with the binary um, binary features with just like on or off the input for this um, but uh, with a continuous feature so like for for every grid you you see here just highlighted and all the other grids you you add a weight as an input and um, therefore you can somewhat approximate the position maybe in a more clever way and um, if one of these features is active you just give a one here to that input and in our case um, we throw as seen here on the one dimensional case so if you would be here only on the x-axis um, we would throw some uh, Gaussian curves uh, to our state space and like if we are for example here in this position um, the 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 uh, feature is not even just one or zero, but it's like the value from the Gaussian curve for the um, feature we have there. You can find more in the book of Bader and Sutton about it. But yeah, this somewhat counteracts like this generalization aspect, right? Because um, if only these, if I'm in this position, I do not directly um, influence like the during the training uh, the the weights which represent like the areas here in the corner but only in in the like uh, range where i'm moving and um, that's like how we can enforce like to influence only the weights here in the middle area and the rest would like not be influenced if i wouldn't go there somewhat in the region and um, since like we see here that they are initialized in the beginning with zero um, and then we can say okay or we can see that um, in this case the agent thinks like because I get a negative reward all of my um, action, uh, action estimators will be like negative so it might be like better for him to go into the corners which encourage exploration additionally yeah, and this we have like done here. Let's make this a little bit bigger again for our uh, function approximator using um, using Sasa. And we haven't uh, not coded this on our own. So like you would do it typically in the uh, afterwards when you have visited this course. I mean you programmed all the um, all, all the algorithms on your own and you know them, but. Um, yeah, from there on you would typically use two boxes which provide like these algorithms and maybe adjust them a little bit. Um, and the same we've used to, like for the feature engineering. So if you'd SK, SK learn here, which like takes some samples of the environment to figure out like how it how it looks like, and then uh, you you fit your your featureizer um, to this um, to to these um, landscape like which in our case uses four types of RBFs which different standard deviations here in this Gaussian curve and um, yeah we have used hundred components like hundred Gaussian curves for each so like if we think about the tiles um, maybe we have like even again here these like like these four tiles with, with hundreds of 
um, squares in it, but in our case um, we have like different standard deviations and 100 of these Gaussian curves per standard deviation, so overall 400 at all. So uh, then we have provided a performance measurement, we'll talk about this later, which just uses uh, um, like uh, the, best, uh, the action epsilon greedy and returns the performance. We have a plotting function again, and then we have our code here. And now instead of the old featureize, which just use the scaling, um, we just use a featureize, the new featureize, which uses the scaling as well, and the RBFs. And what we can see here in the results, if we take a look at it, um, that we are able to yeah, somewhat estimate now our um, our landscape a little bit better and you see here like on this uh, now shown red red curve here that the agent is yeah, somewhat able even to to uh, yeah okay it's would be somewhere here in the end but he's like able to finish the episode and to do the task we will see in the end and this as well looks like somewhat similar to to what we would expect um, here out of out of our lecture, just a little bit shifted in our case. Okay, um, yeah. Then, like, uh, since we introduced that these artificial neural networks are somewhat sensitive to the uh, initial, to the initial um, case, I think it was introduced by by Oliver here, in this case with this inverted pendulum, um, as you see here, that huge spread between the best and the worst in based on the um, uh, on the um, initialization, random initialization. Um, we have like trained, I think I've used 10 agents here for you, and averaged like over the episodes, uh, the, the um, steps it needed per episode. And we can see here, like, after 25 episodes, the agent were like the blue curve is the, the mean here, in average, like to solve the problem, and in the end, like to perform even quite well, the red case is a standard deviation. Uh, the same you can see here for the, um, in, in, in a box plot, which on this side here shows a greedy execution and we see, okay, wow, it's uh, here even under 120 steps. It's possible to solve that, that task here. And if we do, like in case, this is comparison between greedy action and absolute greedy action. So if you um, still take exploration into account, um, yeah, it's, it just um, looks like, yeah, or it's obvious that you do not perform always good, but you still explore, uh, so your overall performance would be worse, right? Okay, yeah, since we like have just seen feature engineering works quite well, to be honest, this is a quite strong tool and maybe already uh, expert knowledge feature base could do the trick, but yeah, like to give you like an example for like a feature engineering tool, we just applied it here and it worked, so like we were happy with that. Um, yeah, in the end, if you have to, like, throw your neural network uh, maybe on a, um, I don't know, on a hardware, <laughs> you would, like, try to reduce maybe the feature engineering to, like, scale down your, your, neural, your weights because, like, um, if we see here uh, the first layer is dependent on the input dimension, we can simply say that in the beginning, in the first example, the input dimension were two, so just the two states, and now, like, we scale this up to, like, 400, so... Like in the, uh, we, we, we even scaled up our, our uh, neuron size we need for that input layer. So we have increased even our neural network and maybe for hardware application you want to reduce this once again. So, but since this worked quite well, um, we thought about, yeah, let's, let's take the same and maybe throw it on a linear estimator where we use online LSPI, which is a least squares policy improvement tool. Um, we might first like take a look at, I think it's yeah, 22. Um, we have used the same like RBFs here, we've been plotting in a performance function. And um, yeah, 
let's maybe compare the code here to the um, to the pseudo code. So what do we need? We need a feature representation which is like in terminal zero and um, should now of course like estimate our action values so um, we have to include the action in this like featureizing and therefore we just like use the state and use that featureize function we might investigate because like our weights we will train here in the end we will need some weights for in, uh, like for initialization which we can then use like for in a for using that action value to, to choose the action here in the policy um, yeah, let's maybe investigate that featureize function which takes the state here and um, which is shown over here okay um, yeah so our featureize function takes the state as well as the action, like I just showed, uh, uh, like I just told, um, we have to include now in our feature engineering the action, like to be able to represent with this linear weights, which is just a vector. Like, okay, I have this action, and uh, how good it is. So um, we just check, like, if we are done, then we use this win flag here, and one minus win flag times the feature vector, like, just nulls out all our output if we're done. And yeah, then uh, we again like normalize it and um, use that that uh, RBFs like for the for the state to like blow it up to that 400 states, and then we add like an input which is one to, like representing. Um, in, in our case the additional action to this vector and then we loop like through the actions we will give here um, additionally as input and we put them all to we, we take a vector here and put them all to zero and only where the action is so like for example if I choose two, two which was I think go to the right um, then only the, the uh, last entrance which represents like the two is um, is chosen to one. And then I loop here through it, and as you see, I I somewhat like uh, append to my feature as vector. I will return in the end um, if the action like uh, has one. I, rep uh, I I add my feature as vector, which is just representing my state plus a binary one input for that action weight. I will train um, to like estimate. Okay, for this states and the action like how good it is and if it's not the case um, I will just add zeros which have the same dimension as my feature as vector and since my feature as vector has a size of 400 plus that one for the action in the end I will come with 3 times 400 plus that 3 actions so 1203 vector which is somewhat if we think about this idea here we have used this in the neural networks, like uh, with one network, like to present the three outputs, which is somewhat related to this idea to my mind. So you throw in like uh, the state, and of course, in the case of linear estimator, we will have to provide it the action as well, um, <coughs> and we will somewhat use different weight pairs, like for this state action combination each. So it's yeah a little bit related. Maybe that, that helps about how this feature IC work. And um, yeah, that, that's like how we go into the code. So maybe let's let's stick to this method here and we see, okay, um, if we compare it like we need some weights, which we initialize here with zeros um, f based on the dimension of this 1203 um, feature as vector and then we like initialize and take an action which we do here reset and then we grab a state mm, and throw it into our policy additionally the weights like we based on that state and the weights um, we calculate like um, <coughs> in our policy 
for the action, action space and the epsilon, like what is our action. Let's take a look at our policy, how this works. Like it takes the states, which the state, which is just that um, state and act, uh, state and um, position and velocity, right? It takes it to a 1,203 uh, vector of linear weights. And um, what we do here is um, like we come up with a feature state and then we like l loop for our number of actions we have and um, calculate like for, for each action the, the action value. So we featureize the state we have and um, Yeah, store it for later on, whatever. Um, and this feature I state, like just learned, has this um, um, this three one thousand uh, one thousand two hundred and three values. We multiply it here with um, with our uh, with our weights, and um, we get four the action E we have used for featureizing. So in the first shot, it's a, um, it's a one, then two, and then three, I think. Um, so for all the three actions, we just estimate separately the Q values here, and then choose like epsilon greedy just in the end, where we have filled up all the three Q values, which just use the max out of this, which is like the position of it, which would be zero, one, or two in the end, which represents an our action. Cool. Mm, yeah, then, um, like, we apply this action to the environment, and, uh, of course, like, w since uh, we then take a next action based on our policy, for based on the next state, the same manner we've, we've just, um, we've just learned so far, and then we go down here into our mm, in, into our um, learning algorithm where our target is just to revert and we add like every time if we get a sample um, we, we use a sample to update our linear estimator I wouldn't go much into detail here um, maybe only as a hint you should take care about this lambda here um, we have just used lambda equals to one, which like means that we do not forget anything. But um, yeah, if you wouldn't do that, um, then like you might be able maybe to estimate the um, the uh, cost to go in a little bit more accurate way. But this could lead to instability uh, because you somewhat gain with the factor smaller than one here, this p, which represents like our, your uncertainty and which could lead then to numerical instability. If you want to learn more about this, I would invite you like uh, to visit a model identification course from Oliver in the next semester, which is kind of cool and like tells you more about this here. Um, yeah, then like we update, we have a new hyperparameter, I miss this. KW, we update our policy like not every time, like to which stabilize the learning a little bit. We will learn even in the next lectures or maybe today. Um, yeah, but in our case, I think every 10 steps, like for maybe learning a little bit better our Q values and then change the policy based on that. Yeah, then, um, yeah, what we just do is here just like go one step forward, forward uh, till it's done and yeah, that's it. And as we can see here in the results um, that like even this linear estimator with the strong tool of feature engineering is uh, able to in a quite cool way to estimate here our uh, cost to go at least in the form we expected it where here is like quite and after after this this hill, it's it's quite low as we see. It's quite dark, and here the cost is quite high. So we have at least comparable, uh, but a little bit downscaled uh, landscape, which which fits somewhat. And we see here in in the performance plot, we're already uh, also like 
<coughs> ten agents were trained over mm, 200 episodes and we see like an average it's even a little bit faster in this case able to learn like the task and that's what I just told and Willem also in this AIDS lecture I think that um, like the artificial neural networks yeah maybe sometimes depending on the, the, the clump complexity of the task it's like valid to think about how hard do I have to go so do not always throw the biggest um, AI like on your problem but but think about it and maybe proper feature engineering like seen here and linear estimator just already do the trick but yeah cool all right that's it for today so I hope you've learned something and like from next week on we will go um, into continuous state space and leave this discrete one thing. Thanks for listening.